Thank you for joining the St. Andrew's Freedom Forum. Uh, we're honored to be joined by His Eminence, Archbishop Elpido Foros, for his first St. Andrew's Freedom Forum uh, presentation, as well as distinguished members of Congress, Congressman John Sarbanes, uh, Representative Terry Sewell, Representative Naguz. Uh, by video, we're being joined by Representative Karen Bass and the president of the St. Andrew's Freedom Forum, Andreas Akaris. St. Andrew is the patron saint of the Greek Orthodox Church and a re representative of religious freedom, which is very much the first freedom in the United States Constitution, uh, one of the essential human rights. And today we celebrate the life of one of the greatest human rights advocates, Representative John Lewis, we represent, we celebrate the Hellenic legacy of, of standing up for human rights. We're, we're obviously going to hear from a lot of speakers, and I'm sure all of them are going to have some allusion to Archbishop Iakovos marching with Dr. King across the bridge on, in Selma, a legacy that we all have to live up to, a legacy of good trouble that we are all committed to. And with that, I turn it over to someone who's been causing and whose family has been causing a lot of good trouble in our community for a long time, my friend, Congressman John Sarbanes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andy. It's, a, it's an honor to be with everybody this evening. Um, I want to thank you for the good work that you do. I want to salute Andreas Akaris, who helped to found, really founded um, more than 10 years ago, the St. Andrews. Freedom Forum, which was an opportunity and remains an opportunity to bring attention not just to the plight of the ecumenical patriarchate um, in modern day Istanbul. And of course, today, November 30th, is the feast day of St. Andrew, who is the patron saint of the ecumenical patriarchate, but to use this on an annual basis um, as an occasion to look at issues of human rights and religious freedom the world over. Uh, normally, if we were not in the midst of this uh, very challenging moment with the pandemic, uh, I would be, along with my uh, colleagues in Congress, uh, inviting people onto Capitol Hill where we would have heard this lecture in person. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues in the Hellenic Caucus um, and my fellow Greeks uh, who currently serve in Congress, uh, Gus Bilirakis, Dina Titus. Chris Pappas, Charlie Chris, who've attended these events over the last few years uh, and helped us to lift up the issues uh, that face the ecumenical patriarchate, but to look more broadly uh, at the uh, concerns around religious freedom and human rights um, across the world. So this year it's being done differently. We're having a Zoom event and um, I'm delighted that we have uh, joining us today uh, three of my colleagues, outstanding colleagues, uh, who serve um, our broad caucus. They serve the Congress. Um, they are all members of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, which I think is very appropriate this evening because we are celebrating the life and legacy of John Lewis. Um, the three members who are, who are joining us tonight uh, have worked closely with John Lewis over many, many years. They remember him as I do and others uh, very fondly, um, but inspirationally for the work that he did, causing, as Andy said, a good trouble um, every day of his life. Uh, so um, in celebrating him and in welcoming his eminence, Archbishop Elpido Foros, and I wanna mention for those on the call who don't know that, know that, that Elpido Foros means bearer of hope, um, which is a very appropriate message, I think, in this moment of challenge um, in our country. Uh, but to celebrate this wonderful connection that we've seen over the years between the African American community and the Greek American community, uh, which really reached its high point when Archbishop Yakovos answered the call, uh, came to Selma and marched with Dr. King in 1965, a moment that was memorialized on the cover of Life Magazine. Uh, so um, let, me, let me go ahead and introduce my colleagues because we want to certainly uh, hear from them. Uh, the first is Karen Bass, who is chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. 
Uh, Karen also serves as chair of the subcommittee on um, Africa, global health and global human rights and international organizations. Um, Karen was the one who helped navigate this very difficult moment a few months ago when we were um, addressing on Capitol Hill the challenge of uh, racial injustice um, and racial violence across the country. And um, we're very privileged that she's joining us tonight, pre-recorded because Karen is on a plane right now headed back to Washington, D.C. Um, but I'd like to play a few minutes of her remarks. Good evening, everyone. Let me thank my good friend, Representative John Sorbanes, for his kind introduction, for his leadership in Congress, and for the invitation to be here with you today. I also want to thank the Archbishop for his leadership, and especially during these difficult times when we are so divided unnecessarily. A unifying figure like the Archbishop is exactly what is needed right now. I also appreciated learning about the patron St. Andrew and the significance of the feast day of St. Andrew and the struggles of the Orthodox Christian Church. It certainly resonates with me as I'm proud to stand in solidarity with the Orthodox Church in its struggle for justice. We have so much in common. A few years ago, I was with Archbishop Demetrius and Representative Sarbanes in Selma for the 50th anniversary of crossing the bridge and all that that represented in the history of our country. The last three years has been so difficult and so divided, but I believe that in a few short weeks, things will begin to change in our country. I also really appreciated His Eminence's comments in Brooklyn in June, standing in solidarity with the African-American community and others protesting a very long history of police abuse in the United States. I was proud to be one of the authors of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in Congress this year, a transformative piece of legislation that came to be because of the brutal torture and murder of George Floyd. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is transformative legislation that did bring Congress together. All of the Democrats and several Republicans voted for the bill that will finally bring accountability and standards and accreditation to policing in the United States. We have over 18,000 police departments, but no national standards for how policing is done. So in one community, a chokehold or a no-knock warrant where you kick the door in that led to the murder of Breonna Taylor is legal, and in another community it isn't. You have standards and accreditation to go to a barber, but a police officer doesn't have that. And so those are just a couple of examples of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that we hope very much to have passed and signed either by the current president or the incoming president. So I just wanna thank you for the invitation for being with you. I look forward to our communities continuing to work together and to stand in solidarity and know always from me Whenever you call, I will be there because I know that our battle for justice is the right one. Thank you so much. So I wanna thank um, uh, Chairwoman Bass for those remarks uh, right on point. Our next, our next speaker with some, with, uh, some greetings is uh, Terry Sewell. Terry and I actually have been friends for many, many years. Uh, she was in my brother's class in college, so uh, we've been close ever since then. Terry Sewell, Congresswoman Sewell, is the person who hosts members of Congress of both parties every year uh, in Selma um, and was joined, obviously, until this, this year uh, by John Lewis in hosting the Faith and Politics pilgrimage to Selma to remember uh, the events of 1965, what happened on Bloody Sunday, what happened on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Um, and she always does it with such grace and poise. Thank you, uh, Terry. Terry serves as vice chair of the House Ways and Means uh, Committee. She's obviously a member of the Congressional uh, Black Caucus, and I thank her for her leadership there. And she's co-chair of the Congressional Voting Rights Caucus. So Terry, welcome and thank you. Well, good evening. As John said, I'm Congresswoman Terry Sewell of Alabama's 7th Congressional District. 
uh, we like to refer to ourselves in the seventh district of Alabama as America's civil rights district. It includes the cities of Birmingham, Montgomery, Tuscaloosa, as well as my hometown of Selma, Alabama. John, I wanna thank you for inviting me to join you all on this feast day of St. Andrew to acknowledge the continuing struggle to secure full rights and dignities within modern day Turkey, as well as to promote the ongoing struggle for religious freedom and human rights across our globe. I also want to thank uh, the St. Andrews Freedom Forum, uh, as well as the Hellenic uh, American Leadership Council. It is an honor to be on this program with his eminence, Archbishop Bishop, and to thank him for his own leadership in standing in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Today's, uh, tonight's theme, a socially just democracy makes for a more perfect union, I believe is a befitting tribute to honor the incredible legacy of my colleague, mentor, and hero, Congressman John Lewis, who understood that progress was elusive, but always worth it. John lived his life as a story of a man in quest for social justice, always pushing this amazing democracy towards a more perfect union. You know, for me, growing up as a little girl in Selma, Alabama, the incredible legacy of Congressman John Lewis and the bravery he showed on the Edmund Pettus Bridge was a hero's tale as familiar to me as any Bible verse or family lore. It is rare that you get to meet your hero and rarer still that you get to work with him and be mentored by him. Never did I think that the cause for which John and so many foot soldiers, including the Archbishop then uh, Yakovich, Yakovus, um, would they fought and some of them shed a little blood on a bridge in my hometown, only to have that sacred right to vote gutted by the Supreme Court in 2013. You know, it reminds me that progress is elusive and that every generation must fight and fight again to preserve the progress that we've made now and to push and advance progress for the future. John Lewis loved this country more than any other person I have met. It was his deep seated patriotism, this love of country and unending faith and hope in the goodness of humanity that allowed him to dedicate his life to the endless challenges and struggle for human and civil rights. While John is gone, his legacy lives on, that quest for a beloved community, for a more perfect union. I know that the Greek Orthodox Church has a rich history of fighting for human rights and civil rights. The historic relationship between the African American and Greek American communities goes back a long way. And it was solidified by your active participation in the historic march from Selma to Montgomery. 55 years ago, against the opposition of his staff and advisors, the Greek Orthodox uh, Archdiocese uh, dia, dia, of North and South America, it was Archbishop that stood arm in arm with the foot soldiers of the movement at Brown Chapel AME Church, which so happens to also be my home church, as well as Selma being my hometown. It was there that he eulogized the Reverend James Reeb. I know that his, his uh, talents were observed then and his participation was so appreciated. You know, I also want to remind us all that John's legacy lives in all of us. It was John Lewis who often would say, if you see something unjust, not right, unfair, we all have a moral obligation to do something about it. He always reminded us to keep the faith, the faith in a humanity that was more good than evil, the faith that we as personal individuals can do something about it if we're willing to work hand in glove with others, people of same mindset and people who want to do so in a nonviolent way. I just wanna say how proud I am of that historic legacy, that historic tradition of the Greek Orthodox Church and the African American uh, community working hand in glove to fight for human rights and civil rights. 
you know, progress is elusive. Old battles have become new again. We've seen it in the struggles that we face this year, the racial reckoning, the public crisis that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused and the ensuing economic crisis. But I know, as John knew, that we will get through it together if we're willing to roll up our sleeves and work together, arm and glove, locked hands as we move forward to get into some good trouble. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to share with you my views on John. I miss him every day and I can't imagine another commemoration of the Selma to Montgomery March occurring this March without him. John, even in sickness, joined us last year for the 55th anniversary of the march from Selma to Montgomery. Frail and in pain, he reminded us that we must keep the faith, that we must press on, that we must not get weary and we must not get tired. His advice is relevant then as it is today, as we continue to celebrate and honor his life let us heed his words and take action. Thank you for the opportunity to provide these greetings with you today. Thank you so much, uh, Terry. You can see why Terry is now picked up the torch uh, from John Lewis uh, with her very powerful and inspirational words. John Lewis knew that he was never on a journey by himself to have people like uh, Terry Sewell at his side made all the difference. And thank you, Terry, for joining us this evening. Our last speaker before we get to uh, his eminence is Joe Nagoose. And I asked Joe to come on, uh, not just because of the leadership he's already exercising in Congress, and he's been with us for two years, but he's um, already very, very seasoned in his work and commitment. And he was recently um, elected as one of the co-chairs of the House Democratic Policy and Communications Committee, um, which is a very important way of sort of sharing information about what's happening in Washington with people around the country. But I also learned that Joe uh, attends a Greek Orthodox church in Denver. And when I heard that, I said, well, you absolutely have to be part of this um, Zoom event with us. And he was gracious enough to, to join us and share a few words. So Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Well, uh, thank you so much, John, for that very kind introduction. And good evening, everyone. My name is Joe Nagoose, I'm proud to represent Colorado's 2nd Congressional District, uh, and my distinct honor, of course, to join you tonight in commemorating St. Andrew's Day, and in particular to pay tribute to Congressman John Lewis, who has laid the very foundation that so many of us stand on. And I, I must say it is it hard, if not impossible, to follow uh, the wonderful Terry Sewell, who is a mentor uh, of mine and is one of the brightest lights in the United States Congress. I also want to thank my good friend, John Sarbanes, who's been a great mentor to me as a freshman member of Congress. Thank you for the invitation, John. And of course, to the Archbishop, thank you for, for your leadership. In the beginning of his discipleship, uh, the first called apostle, St. Andrew, rose one morning, looked out to the vista before him and declared, upon these hills shall shine forth the beneficence of God. And there will be a great city here, and God shall raise up many churches. Thus began St. Andrew's great labor of love to deliver the teachings and the faith of the Orthodox Church to the masses. From those hills of Kiev to the, the streets of Istanbul to the bridges of Selma, Alabama, the Orthodox Church has for centuries stood for justice and peace through the unshakable faith demonstrated by St. Andrew. In his own toils for equality in our nation, as you heard from uh, our good friend Terry Sewell, Congressman Lewis set one of humanity's greatest examples, in my view, of allowing unwavering faith to guide one's principles and actions and thereby define the progress of a nation. John Lewis and so many others who put their very lives on the line for equal rights, including members of the Orthodox Church who joined the civil rights movement, were the call to conscience that declared to our nation, none of us are free until each of us is free. There is no justice for one until there is justice for all. Through this work, Congressman Lewis was the very living embodiment of, of the strength and the fortitude of faith. From the core of his being and with his life on the line, Congressman Lewis's leadership was rooted in the strong religious conviction of finding the common humanity in everyone. 
And as we learned from Congressman Lewis and his fellow freedom fighters, the strength of our nation comes from the empowerment of all peoples. As enfranchisement became more equitable, so too became our society and our democracy. Opportunity in everything from representation to education to economic prosperity grew as they worked to make full equality under the law a reality. Congressman Lewis's legacy inspires us today to continue the work left before us. As our nation faces historic interconnected crises, we must look to his example to find a path forward that leaves none of us behind. While there are many tangible strategies leading our path from economic justice, uh, to continued access to the ballot, to the need for accessible health care for every American. You heard uh, Chairwoman Bass of the Congressional Black Caucus talk about many of the potential paths forward. It is the intangible qualities held by Mr. Lewis that I personally find the most inspiring. The highest being choosing love. Mr. Lewis once said, I'll quote, hold only love, only peace in your heart, knowing that the battle of good to overcome evil is already won. For our nation to prosper and for the well-being of each of our people and the people of the world over, we must lead our lives out of love for one another. It is only from this wellspring of love and faith that we work, that we together can create a more perfect union. And as you can hear, uh, my uh, two-year-old daughter, Natalie, who's enjoying participating in this presentation and whom I love very dearly. Um, so I like to end with a quote from St. Andrew, who is uh, noted as saying that love is acceptance. When you love someone, you take them into your heart. And that is truly why it hurts so much when we lose someone we love, because we lose a part of ourselves. As Congresswoman Sewell said, it's from a deep sense of love that the loss of uh, Congressman Lewis hurts us. But the part of ourselves that he formed, the, the conscience of our nation that, that he helped create, exists still in each of us. And it's our duty and our honor to continue the work still yet to be accomplished in our nation. So in the example of Congressman Lewis and in the teachings of St. Andrew, I look forward to our work ahead and to partnering with each of you as we form a world based in faith and justice, hope and love. Thank you again for having me here today. Uh, may God bless you and our country on this holy day and on each of the days moving forward. Thanks again, John, for having me. Thank you so much, Joe. Those were wonderful words. I appreciate your joining us uh, this evening. Every one of these introductory remarks has been inspirational. Um, and now we get to the main event. Um, I want to thank His Eminence Archbishop El Pivo Flores for joining us tonight uh, to deliver an address. Um, as many of you on this call, I'm sure, already know, uh, last June, June of 2019, His Eminence uh, became the eighth Archbishop of America um, since they were first um, elected um, in 1922. Uh, to lead the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America to preside over uh, more than 500 parishes across the United States uh, of America. And he is the direct successor, obviously, to Archbishop Yakovos, who we've mentioned a number of times already on this call, and who marched with Dr. King in Selma in 1965. I just want to thank the Archbishop, because in the short time since he's assumed his position of leadership, um, he's demonstrated uh, an instinct for reaching out broadly to diverse communities uh, and communities of faith, of course, and trying to build bridges um, and achieve the common humanity, uh, which can overcome intolerance, uh, that can further compassion um, and advance the kind of solidarity uh, that we want to see in our nation and across the world. And so uh, I'm delighted to be able to to, to be with you uh, tonight as we welcome Archbishop El Piva for us again, the bearer of hope. Um, like Archbishop Yakovos, who marched with Dr. King in 1965, um, Archbishop El Piva Flores has demonstrated uh, that he also can march in solidarity uh, with communities that are experiencing uh, discrimination and violence, and we salute him for that. So we're very much looking forward uh, to your address this evening, Your Eminence, uh, entitled, A Socially Just Democracy Makes for a More Perfect Union. Thank you, John. Uh, dear friends, first of all, allow me to thank the organizers for, of this evening's dialogue, 
for their commitment to holding the annual St. Andrew's Human Rights and Religious Freedom Forum as a virtual event. In particular, let me recognize Congressman John Sarbanes of Maryland's third district, who continues to serve as the host of this important day. Both the Congressman and his esteemed father, Senator Paul Sarbanes, have been exceptional friends of the Ecumenical Patriarchate for decades and have long been champions of universal human rights. I also recognize his fellow members of the United States House of Representatives, the Honorable Karen Bass of California's 37th District, the Honorable Joseph Neguse of Colorado's 2nd District, and the Honorable Terry Sewell of Alabama's 7th District. I express as well my thanks to Mr. Andreas Akaras, the Advisory Council of St. Andrew's Freedom of Forum, as well as to Mr. Andy Zemenidis and the Hellenic American Leadership Council for co-sponsoring this event. Our subject today, a socially just democracy makes for a more perfect union. This subject is being offered in honor and memory of the late Congressman John Lewis. His loss to our country this past July was a deeply felt blow by all Americans of goodwill and true patriotism. His example was an inspiration for all Americans, for all Americans who value the principles of freedom, principles of equality, and principles of dignity for all human beings. He ascended from being the son of scarecroppers a condition of poverty and human bondage to inhabit the halls of Congress, where he served for 17 terms and gave expression to the conscience of the nation. Through the decades, the unwarily spoke truth to power, even at great risk to his own life. Our theme this evening may seem self-evident, yet it warrants reflection, introspection, and action. So I ask this, what makes for a definition of social justice that enhances the experience of democracy for all citizens? We would likely hear a broad spectrum of answers to this question, depending upon one's economic condition, race, or other forms of identity, self-perceived social status, and indeed personal history, philosophy of life, and worldview. In addition, when the phrase a more perfect union was written, these four words from the famous 52 that form the preamble of the Constitution of the United States of America. So when these words were written, the founders did not envision that the creation of a more perfect union would be brought to fruition with the inclusion of blacks, with the inclusion of Native Americans, and even women. These were populations who were subjected to enslavement, subjected to genocide, and subjected to marginalization, respectively. For this reason, we should not succumb to the tendency to romanticize a past which ignores these very people. The notion of justice for those subjugated against their will, exploited for economic and political gain, denied the franchise, and even culturally and physically exterminated must be taken seriously. In this regard, America's civil war rooted in the evil of slavery, was a war about the meaning of a more perfect union. Christianity itself has a responsibility articulated in the teachings of Jesus Christ, in the teachings of his apostles and all believers, to reject enslavement of any kind. Indeed, 
Orthodox Christianity understands the human person as a created out of God's love in freedom. Freedom is our ontological reality. So to be a human person is to be free. Yet, tragically, many Christians in America distorted and abused the gospel, citing the verse from St. Paul who wrote, Slaves, obey to your earthly masters with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as you obey Christ. And they used these words of St. Paul to justify the enslavement of blacks and misusing religion to stain the democratic ideals of this country. This passage must never again be deployed to destroy freedom, to destroy personhood, and to destroy human dignity. We must never allow to pass into oblivion the fact that as Yale University professor of history, Alan Mikhail has observed, and I quote his words, it is estimated that 90% of the native population of the Americas died between 1492 and the middle of the 17th century, a decline from 60 million to 6 million, and about 13 million Africans, 13 million Africans were brought to the Americans as slaves. Never before in the world history had genocide occurred on the scale of the continent, obliterating languages and cultures, cities and histories. These are the words of the professor. My friends, as we contemplate the price in human lives that has been paid and that is a tragic part of America's democratic experiment, we must acknowledge that the realities of slavery and discrimination and the fact that we are only 100 years from the ratification of women's suffrage have undermined the capacity for liberty and justice for all. So, to continue purposefully, decisively, spiritually moving towards a more perfect union, we must also be honest, honest and bold in our assessments. As an Orthodox Christian and as a child of the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople in Istanbul, I am an heir of the rich tradition of the See of St. Andrew, founded with the origins of Christianity, the church whose feast we celebrate this day. For three quarters of this duration, the state was an empire and indeed the continuation of the very Roman Empire, which crucified our Lord Jesus Christ. And when the Ottoman Empire supplanted the Byzantine Empire, religion became the all-encompassing justification for violations of human freedom and for the enslavement of certain communities, something witnessed even in our own days. Indeed, I remind us that the 6th century code of the Byzantine Emperor Justinian, a massive corpus of law that became the foundation for the modern law, recognized that a slave's life breath did not belong to his so-called owner. It was in Byzantium, informed by the Orthodox Christian teaching, that Justinian's Codex made clear that to take the life of slave was to commit murder. 1500 years before the American experiment, this Christian empire was not perfect, but at least in this regard, certainly better. Therefore, what is the more perfect union that we seek? And how is social justice intrinsic to a more perfect union? For Orthodox Christianity, 
the answers that we seek and that can enrich our transfigurative work here as Americans, the principles of social justice that can make our political union more perfect are to be found in the deep theology of the great Church of Christ, which is the ecumenical patriarchy, which has upheld them through the millennia because they are the gospel of Christ. It was within the boundaries of the ecumenical patriarchy that the theological constitution of the undivided Christian church was written in the era of the seven ecumenical councils from the year 325 to 787 AD in Constantinople, in, Con in Istanbul, in Nicaea, in Ephesus, in Chalcedon, these ancient centers of Christian thought and practice, some of which go back to the New Testament, the theological and Christological doctrines of the church were defined once and for all time. In these ancient cities, two absolute truths shined forth, the mystery of the Holy Trinity and the person of Jesus Christ. In the Holy Trinity, we observe the communion of the divine persons, the three persons, intertwined in a seamless and endless communion of love. This communion is expressed through freedom. The freedom, relationality, and uniqueness of each person in the Trinity provides a set of touch points for us, touch points to make sense of how we can live in a society, recognizing that each of us can be free only by respecting the freedom of others. Each of us can become ourselves only by respecting and celebrating the uniqueness and the diversity of others. And each of us can enjoy the fullness of our human dignity by committing the protection of that same dignity in each and every person. As it is above, so it should be below. We are also called to be in communion, in relationship with one another. Our relationships are to be based upon a just and righteous equality of value, because every person is equally valued by God who is not, as the scripture says, a respecter of persons. This expression from the mouth of St. Peter was a first step for him to understand that the gospel applied to Gentiles as well as Jews, to everyone. He was working on his own more perfect union, as he argued with St. Paul about the status of these non-Jewish converts. But in the end, the circle widened and the inclusivity of the gospel triumphed, but it did not last. We must acknowledge and repent for the fact that America is not without its own original sin. In fact, we have two, two original sins, slavery and genocide. The repentance necessitated by these evils can only be found in the exercise of equal justice for all, with remembrance of what was lost in prior generations. As someone who has witnessed and experienced with his own eyes the Christian minority communities of Anatolia in the Middle East, treated without regard to equality, and without regard to rule of law, I can tell you that until there is social justice for all, the ideals of democracy can never be truly achieved. As someone who has lived a part, as part of a separate and unequal class of citizens because of my religious and national identity, I can tell you that until there is equality before the law, the principles of democracy can never be truly fulfilled in practice. Therefore, we must 
ask ourselves the following question. In 2000 years, could not the human family have come further in order to be more perfect? I believe the answer, my friends, is in the second doctrinal bequest that comes from the Orthodox Church. And this is the doctrine of the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. If there is one, if there is singular conclusion from the doctrinal formulations of the seven ecumenical councils, it is then this, that in Christ, every human being is redeemed. Every human being is liberated. And every human being enters into a communion of personhood that they share with every other human being and indeed with creation itself. In Christ, the duality of objectification is overcome and the identification of self with other is made possible through love. Or as St. Paul puts in his letter to the Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Jesus Christ. The Christian affirmation of the societal justice that builds a more perfect union is found in the most profound truth of the ecumenical councils that in Christ, we are one and that every human being is loved is loved equally by god i never had the privilege to meet john lewis unfortunately but i'm certain that his faith in god was as orthodox as what i have described because his life was a living testimony to that faith that could be read by everyone. He spared not even his own blood in the course of truth. He gave us many, many gifts throughout his life. And in his death, he left us with a message of hope and inspiration. He wrote, though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love, and the way of nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now, it is your turn to let freedom ring. These are his words. My friends, if we truly want a more perfect union, then we must find the path to the more excellent way that the beloved John Lewis invoked in his last testament to us. Indeed, now is our turn to let freedom ring, ring for all Americans. If justice is ever to roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Thank you for your kind attention. Your Eminence, thank you for a wonderful expression of uh, Orthodox Christian views and uh, the democratic principles here in the US. Uh, now for the audience, uh, we'll be taking questions uh, so we may move forward with the question and answer session of the program uh, and that will be our last um, step in this evening's uh, online presentation and uh, your eminence i have a few questions here to begin with already uh, the first being how does christian orthodoxy inform your views on social justice issues such as race relations? Uh, the, the, the source of uh, our behavior and of our beliefs as uh, clergymen and as a man, as people of faith, 
is first uh, the teaching of our church, uh, the teaching of the gospel. As I already mentioned, for us, there is no man, there is no woman, there is no nationality. We are all equal, free creations of our Lord uh, himself who created us all equally in his own image and likeness. And of course, after the gospel uh, and the teaching is the practice and the experience that we have in the church. And this comes uh, from the history of our church, how our church applied these teachings. And especially here in the United States, we have the a brilliant example of my predecessor, Archbishop Iacobos of blessed memory, who marched in Selma, Alabama, together with Dr. King giving an example to all the members of our church how we should uh, practice our faith. And personally, coming from the Ecumenical Patriarchate and being a spiritual child of the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, who is in service as a patriarch 30 years now, I have his own uh, example in my life, teaching me to support freedom, to support equality among nations, respect to the human personality without uh, uh, regarding any other characteristic other than the creation of the Lord. Your Eminence, a question I've just received is, uh, how do you respond to those who criticize what is now taking place on the streets in the US as part of the protest? Uh, those who feel that these protests are um, unworthy to be expressed as they are. I am aware of these reactions, which I receive personally as Archbishop. Uh, you know that um, uh, we have uh, all kind of uh, convictions and uh, beliefs in our community. There are people who are not very friendly with the, the idea that we should support uh, the movement of the black lives that matter. And, uh, and they criticize the Archbishop for participating in this kind of um, uh, marches and uh, demonstrations. Uh, I try to respond that it is my duty as the Archbishop, it is my duty as a man uh, of faith and as a man of the gospel to follow the teachings of the gospel and the tradition of our church, which is support to those who are indeed, who those who experience injustice, those who experience violence without using any violence for that and support and be next to the people who seek for justice in this country. This a church which we lead and which we are member of does not care only for eternity or the kingdom of heaven, but has to respond to the daily concerns of our society where we, if we have problems of democracy, if we have problems of injustice, we, we need to offer our contribution, our work in truth. And we have to speak truth in love. This is the secret and this is, I think, the key. We have to tell the truth, but with love. Love means non-violence. Love means without using uh, expressions that exclude other people from the kingdom of heaven, which begins from here and which includes everybody. Um, Your Eminence, I have two questions, which I'm gonna to try to make one, um, which is one part is uh, how can the church address these issues while respecting the notions of separation of church and state here in America? And as well, in that regard, what is the role of faith in a society that wants to heal political divisions? Uh, we are members of the church, uh, but at the same time, we are citizens of this country. Uh, the citizenship is not... Uh, separate from uh, the membership of the church, which means that our faith influences the way we behave as citizens. Uh, 
uh, and I don't uh, want to say that, it, that our faith defines our political uh, uh, beliefs. We can be Democrats or we can be Republicans. Uh, this is not imposed by our uh, faith, but whatever we are, we have to be, um, uh, we have to follow democratic values, we have to follow human rights, and we have to support religious freedom and justice for everybody. These are values uh, which we have uh, from the gospel, and of course, they are not identical with any political party. Another question, Your Eminence. Um, tonight we heard the call to love or agape from St. Andrew, from St. Paul, from Representative Lewis. But so much of our rhetoric today is dominated by hate. How can the church and the faithful help bridge the gap between values like agape and the public rhetoric we are enduring? I think it continues upon what you were saying. Uh, this is exactly what I'm trying to, uh, to preach every time I, I celebrate the services in, in Sundays in different parishes, uh, dear Andrea, that uh, we need to keep the values uh, that our faith uh, teaches us. And we, we cannot let any hatred, any reason to divide our people, to divide our church, to divide uh, our nation. The division is coming uh, from the evil one whose name is defined by that. The, the evil one is the one who divides. God and love, they unite people. And no person is identical in beliefs and ideas with any other. We are all different people. We have uh, different convictions, we have different beliefs, but uh, the love of Christ, the love of the church, and the love of the human values, which we all support, they have to unite us. Love is the teaching of the gospel. That makes the difference of a membership of our church. One more question, uh, Your Eminence, along this line of uh, uh, questions. Why do some people who seemingly have faith in God, Jesus, arrive at the conclusion that some humans are not entitled to social justice? And I would suspect what's the opposite of, uh, of this question as well. I, I cannot imagine that uh, there are uh, people out there who, uh, who believe that there are people who, uh, who, cannot, uh, who are not uh, entitled to have uh, social uh, justice or freedom or all the other values that all Americans uh, share here. And uh, this is uh, exactly what the American dream is all about. People from all around the world immigrated to this beautiful country to join democracy, freedom, and prosperity. And I think it's the wrong place. America is the wrong place to teach, for someone to teach that equality and justice is not for everyone. Moving on to another area of questions, uh, Your Eminence. Uh, we all hear over and over voices uh, saying that America is a divided nation. Do you believe that there is room and a way for all Americans to engage in civil conversation to tackle the thorny issues that seem so divisive at the moment? I live in this country and I experience the, the challenges that we face as a society which uh, were caused uh, because of the recent elections. But I am very much optimistic that uh, uh, now we, uh, we, can, we can see each other as equals, as brothers and sisters, and as Americans belonging to one nation, following them the same principles and respecting each other and supporting and healing whatever we see injustice, whatever we see hatred, whatever we see violence, we have to face that with love, with uh, Christian solidarity, and to do what we have to do, to support the weak and those who suffer injustice. This is our, what we have to do, our duty as Christians and as Americans. Your Eminence, we've uh, gone beyond seven o'clock, so I'm gonna just ask two more questions. 
and we'll close the program. So uh, this one's a little long, so I'm going to try to cut it down. But uh, based on your experiences, uh, what you witnessed in Turkey uh, and of notions of separate and unequal status, particularly for Christians and Jews and other religious minorities committed to democracy in Turkey, what can you tell us? Can you tell us more about this and how the ecumenical patriarchy deals with this reality of modern day uh, discrimination in Turkey? We Greeks uh, uh, in the history suffered a lot uh, as slaves and occupied people over 400 years. Uh, and I'm sure we all remember that next year, Greece celebrates the 200 years anniversary of the Greek Revolution uh, to recover freedom. And I'm coming from uh, Istanbul. I'm a part of uh, a, uh, the Greek minority, Greek Orthodox minority of Turkey. And I experienced uh, in my own life, in my daily life, this um, uh, unequality, this lack of respect, and uh, this uh, thought and practice that we are not equal citizens, that we do not deserve equal rights. We are not all equal people in this country, in Turkey. I experienced the very, very difficult times which then um, forced my family at the age of uh, 10 to immigrate and to uh, leave Turkey and to go elsewhere to start a new life. I went back to Istanbul later and I experienced the good times when the state started little by little recognizing again equal civil rights to the minorities and Greek minority experienced these good times. In the last years, again, we see a deterioration of the situation and of the behavior towards the minorities in Turkey. I mean that, uh, for me, the difficulties and the inequality in a state is not just a teaching. It's not something that I read in the books. It's something that I personally experienced in my whole life. And I'm talking out of experience. We need to be one nation we need here in America, we need to support and love each other, leave hatred and division aside, and accept the opinion of the other in the uh, framework and the civilized way that we learned all these years, respecting the different opinion, opening dialogue, listening to the other, not necessarily accept his uh, beliefs or her beliefs, but listen and learn. And of course, if we think that the truth is on the other side, do not hesitate to embrace that truth. But there is only one truth, which is dialogue, which is love, and which is the acceptance of the other. Stick on that and we will keep America high, prosperous, democratic, with human rights, an example for the rest of the world. Your Eminence, and the last question, how may we best honor the legacy of Congressman John Lewis, Dr. Martin Luther King, and Archbishop Yakovos? Is to preach what they preached and to practice what they practice. So there are two things, is the belief, the conviction, and then the practice. It's sometimes easier to teach and more difficult to practice. We need to struggle both and offer examples to our children and to the next generation. So that the same way we invoke today the examples of uh, uh, Archbishop Iacobos and John Lewis, uh, the same way our successors will invoke our names, saying that there were more people and that every generation will offer more examples to the world and to America of respecting human rights and healing injustice and hatred and division in this country. 
Your Eminence, I want to thank you for providing us with these unvarnished and very thoughtful expressions, um, commenting on our current events, uh, the challenges of not only the society here in the US, but in general human relations as they're being defined in democracies and not so democracies around the world. So I, I want to say thank you. Thank you on behalf of the Freedom Forum. Uh, and I and many friends and supporters. And I also want to share a moment of privilege that uh, I can't believe that when I was on Congressman Sarbanes staff and we met more than a decade ago, uh, randomly at the Patriarchate, that we would be here today, you as Archbishop, uh, my Archbishop, uh, and supporting the, the St. Andrew's Freedom Forum uh, with this presentation. So I'm Thank you, Andrea, and happy name day for your name day today, Andreas, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. And we will, we will be sure um, to post this um, uh, recorded event and uh, those on the audience may present it to their friends and family and we'll be sure to circulate it as well. And again, thank you uh, for providing us with this opportunity. And to all, a good evening. Thank you.